And that is why we are so honored to have our honoree Dana Remus with us today. Uh, because Dana really exemplifies everything that I've been talking about uh, and has lived almost every phase of the legal profession, right? She has uh, been obviously a law student, but she's then been a associated crevasse. She's then been a law clerk. Uh, she's then been a, uh, a, a lawyer in the White House Counsel's Office. She's been the White House Counsel. She's been a general counsel of a private foundation. She has really touched on so many aspects of our profession. And in doing these things, she has always kept in mind something that she wrote actually when I knew her, uh, when she was just a mere law professor at the University of North Carolina School of Law. She said, you know, despite the adversarial nature of our legal system and the inescapable nature of, she said, the inescapable nature of lawyering is that the legal profession performs an essential form of social work. Supported by the professional firm, lawyers shape the production and interaction of law by mediating the relationships pursuant to law rather than wealth and power. I can't think of a better aspirational goal for our profession and a better person to exemplify what we think of as our award for global leadership than Dana Remus. Please welcome Dana to the stage. Thank you, David. To you, to the members of the host committee, Ken, who's not here, Brad and Tracy, to Brian and everyone who planned this wonderful evening, thank you for inviting me and including me. I'm beyond honored to mark the center's 40th anniversary. I've been inspired by the center since I started my academic career 20 years ago, uh, when the late, great Jeffrey Hazard a pioneer of the field of legal ethics, pointed me to it as a unique and critical entity leading research and analysis on the profession. The important role that the center has played now for 40 years is the direct work of the tire, direct result of the tireless work of its faculty, fellows, staff, and alumni all of whom are committed to understanding and addressing the challenges facing our profession today. And no one embodies that commitment more than my dear mentor and friend, David Wilkins. So I would like to ask you all to join me in again congratulating him for his 30 years of leadership <laughs> and friendship at the center. Most of our program is going to be a conversation, which I think is going to be more fun and interesting than just direct remarks by me. Um, but I do want to say a few words first about something that is core to the profession and something that unifies all of us, notwithstanding our different backgrounds, our different career paths, our different motivations. Um, that is something that I'm quite confident played a role in inspiring all of our paths, and it is respect for the rule of law. As we sit here tonight, there is no shortage of headlines or worries about the undermining of the rule of law. We are still dealing with the aftermath of an assault on our Constitution and our institutions that was provoked and fanned by those sworn to protect them. Judges have been, are being subjected to cruel attacks in an effort to diminish their independence. Amidst this, much of our collective attention has focused on how the rule of law has barely survived. But 
For a few minutes tonight, I want to focus our attention on the optimistic part of the story, which is that the rule of law did survive. And it did because of those sworn to uphold it, lawyers. We held an election and we respected the results. We came back, uh, the country and the economy kept functioning. We restored respect for unwritten norms in government. People kept obeying court decisions, even those with which they passionately disagreed, and were, again, defending democracy abroad. It survived the rule of law in large part because we have a profession uniting us all around the oath that we take as lawyers. We all remember the day where we swore to support our nation's constitution and the constitutions of our respective states, to faithfully discharge the duties of an attorney and to conduct ourselves with integrity. In taking that oath, we all made a commitment to uphold the law. It's a commitment that every lawyer makes regardless of their career path. Now, in recent years, there's no question that lawyers in all sectors of the profession have needed to work particularly hard in maintaining that, that commitment. Government lawyers, voting rights and democracy litigators, academics and judges, also lawyers in private practice, associates and partners at law firms big and small, in-house counsel, solo practitioners. And this is critical. There is no one sector of our profession that has the sole claim to or the sole responsibility for preserving the rule of law. No one type of lawyer that embodies the highest virtues of our profession. To the contrary, it's the exact opposite. We have a system in which every lawyer plays a vital role. And this is at the core of why it's critical that we're a profession and not just a business or a vocation. We're unified by core values that in part motivate our path and in part are instilled by our path. Yes, we engage in the practice of law to support ourselves and our families, but we also do so because we are inspired by our system, our government, our democracy, all rooted in law. Now, I certainly don't want to sound like I'm blind to the profession's flaws. While I don't agree with critiques that there are too many lawyers or that the profession is just a protectionist structure, there's no doubt that our profession can be and truly needs to be better. We need to deliver legal services to the countless people who need them, who can't access them and aren't accessing them, which requires developing creative solutions to meeting people where they are. We need to deliver better legal services more efficiently, which entails leveraging new technologies. And we need to ensure that the law evolves in ways that reflect the needs and interests of all of society. And this is where the Center on the Legal Profession comes in. If the task were easy, we would have already done it. The problem is that the task is terribly hard. But the center is at the forefront of helping us to understand, to craft, and to implement solutions. It always has been doing this in no small part because of David Wilkins. There has, is no one who has studied the legal profession as much as he has. No one more invested in its future and no one with greater ability to see that in every challenge there is an opportunity to make positive change. Under David's leadership, the center's interdisciplinary approach to the themes of globalization, innovation, legal education, and diversity is by the day building a better legal profession. It's producing better law students, better practitioners, and better leaders. It's helping us continue the critical work of preserving the rule of law. And it is why I am so optimistic about what we can collectively do in supporting the center and working through the center. So with that, I think we're gonna have a discussion.
sure it can't be missed. Um, and it also can't be missed since we're talking about all the incredible support that you have, that you are supported here by your family. And I would just like to thank your husband and your parents for joining us here for this evening. Thank you very much. As I will say, uh, Thursday, actually starting tomorrow, because tomorrow's class day, Thursday's graduation, I will say over and over again uh, that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And we know that our job as teachers is mostly just to try to not get in the way of the good work that parents have done and the support that spouses have done. So thank you very much. <laughs> I'll also say over and over again that their students were the smartest ones in the, but we'll move past that. Uh, they deserve that for everything that they put into getting their law degrees. Uh, Dana, thank you so much uh, for being here. And, and like you, I don't want to talk politics per se, but we have to talk about the moment we're in. And I want to kind of pick up uh, with the, the main theme of your remarks, but to ask you maybe to talk a little bit about how you have managed actually to work across so many of the divides that seem to divide us. Uh, you clerk for Justice Alito and you work for President Biden. Uh, you taught a course with Mike Lee, and you have uh, written very passionately about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, you have really managed to chart a course in your own career that has managed to uphold the ideals you speak about without being pulled too far apart by the forces that seek to pull us all apart. And I wonder kind of Talk a little bit about how you've done that and, and what lessons there might be uh, for us as a profession to try to exemplify that role. Um, I have a couple thoughts in response. One is that I have frequently felt so grateful that I am a lawyer and I have something um, that I hew to above politics, which is law. Um, I, in the White House, frequently thought about um, how hard it must sometimes be to be a policymaker without um, legal tra training or without a, a commitment to law, um, because law is something that transcends politics and transcends policies and is at the basis of our system. Um, and I would, any day of the week, rather commit to our system and our democracy and our government than a particular policy, which is not to say that I don't feel incredibly passionate about particular policies, um, but at the end of the day, I think law is what upholds it. Um, and I think lawyers can speak to each other by coming back to that fundamental. The second thing I will say is broader, um, and it sounds cliche, but it is so true, if the entire country um, had the experience of talking to people with whom they disagreed on a regular basis, we would be less polarized. It is hard work. It is so much more productive than always talking to people with whom you agree um, for a couple reasons. One, it makes you smarter and better and more articulate because it points out holes in your reasoning or holes in your articulation, sometimes it changes your mind. All the time it builds empathy. Um, and that's another piece that I think is just um, 
kind of critical in charting our path ahead as a profession, which I think we've started to talk about more. But of course, it's at the base of, of good client service to have empathy. But I think having empathy in all aspects of life um, uh, is critical. So that actually leads to the second question I wanted to ask, which picks up on something that you worked on long before most of us were thinking about it. Because those ideas of human interaction, of empathy, of um, building knowledge and compassion about people, arguably is becoming more difficult in the age of technology. Uh, and in particular, uh, technology like artificial intelligence and chat GPT. I, I've been telling people that every other word that's been said to me since like the beginning of the year is chat GPT and every other one of those words has been said by chat GPT. Uh, and the point is we're not going to actually be harder and harder to know what, oh, is, there, is everything okay? Is everything okay? Okay. Hold on, take your time. Okay? Okay, take your time. You know, one of the things that this pandemic, I hope, has taught us is the critical idea of face-to-face -face interaction and empathy in, in just the way we were talking about. And you wrote um, kind of very skeptically a long time ago a series of articles about artificial intelligence. And I wonder how you think about that now. Uh, as you see the developments that are happening? Um, so I actually don't think of it that differently. I think it is a core challenge for us to embrace AI and various new technologies because it's part of how we'll be more efficient as a profession and part of how we can deliver legal services more quickly, more cost effectively, more broadly. Um, so I actually think in part we should embrace it, but use smartly because there are critical things that it can't do, and I will not say it can never do, but it will be a long time before it can ever do it. Um, and I'll list some. Um, the access to justice gap. You know, we hear so much about how technology is the answer. Technology is certainly part of the answer, but so much of the problem is clients, I shouldn't even call them clients, individuals who have major problems and don't know that they are legal problems or don't know that they're in part legal problems, um, don't even know how to think about reaching out for legal help. We need to meet people where they are with their problems and chat GPT is not ready to do that right now. So maybe once we reach them, we can use ChatGPT to get them help. But one problem is it does not address that at all. One problem which we started to talk about, the empathy piece of representation. Um, it doesn't build relationships. And in critical moments, to be good lawyers, we have to have relationships, both to elicit information to understand what the problem is and also to give the best advice. Um, I will now embarrass my father, who is here, who taught me one of the most essential, maybe the most essential lesson I have learned about good lawyering, and that is how to tell clients information they don't want to hear, how to say no to clients, which is really hard to do well, because you need them to trust you. You need them to realize you are saying no because this is not a legal path and you are still their teammate and you are gonna figure out another way to help them get where they wanna be. Um, that's an incredibly difficult thing to do. 
Um, to this day, it's so easy to say, it's so easy to think, of course that's the right way to lawyer. It's so hard in the moment, especially when you're intimidated by your client or we're all human, we want our clients to like us. Um, if a client just reads on ChatGPT, this is not a good idea, they're gonna think, what do you know, ChatGPT? You don't understand my problems. Um, the third reason it can't be the answer is how law develops over time is fundamental to our country and our system, and it requires creative lawyering. It requires taking concepts from one area of law and importing them to another area of law. It requires creativity and thinking about what the new problem is. And if we rely too heavily on technology, it is inevitable that those smart lawyers are gonna end up representing clients who can pay big money for them, um, and people who don't have the money for really creative, smart lawyers will just have the technology, and then over time, our law is gonna over-torque on reflecting the interests of corporate America and under-torque on individuals and others. So, for all these reasons, ChatGPT isn't the answer and can't be the answer, but it can be part of an answer. And you know, I say chat GPT, but I mean technology at large. Um, and you mentioned that before, this before, but that means that a critical part of the path ahead is making sure that we have sufficient technical expertise in our profession, which isn't to say that every single one of us needs to be a computer scientist, um, but we need computer scientists. We need to find those people and bring them in. We need, um, mixed expertise to, to figure out um, how to incorporate technology, which again, this is gonna be a theme, it is you know a critical thing that the, the center is doing, figuring out how to bring in other essential aspects of expertise. So one of the things we did just a few weeks ago was we had about 60 legal operations professionals from companies, law firms, governments. In fact, Dan Yee, who invented legal operations for the federal government, runs it for the Department of Justice is here with us, uh, precisely because we need to think about these multiple expertises. But in order to do that, we need to uh, address the single hardest diversity issue that lawyers face, which is uh, the divide between lawyers and people we foolishly call non-lawyers, <laughs> which is the rest of humanity. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, we should ban this word. Nobody likes it. Doctors don't call people non-doctors. <laughs> you know? And if we're going to solve this problem, we need the expertise of people who are oftentimes much more credentialed than we are uh, to help us solve it. But that does lead to another form of diversity, which I can't help but uh, ask you about because, of course, it hasn't escaped my guesses, the attention of the audience, that you are a woman and that you are have occupied several positions uh, where there have been very few women. I think you're only uh, the third person ever to be, women ever to be a White House counsel and only the second to be the full-time uh, White House counsel. Um, you're now a, a partner in a major law firm and I won't, I think you're managing partners here. I won't ask the percentage of women partners here, but it's not as many as we wish it would uh, be. And gender often still stands as a constraint or a barrier to the exact kind of trust that you were speaking about before, and I, I just wonder how you've thought about it. When you became a, a law professor at the University of North Carolina, there weren't a lot of women on that faculty at that time, I know. And so uh, how do you think about that and what advice are you giving uh, those who are coming behind you about how to think about this? So I am gonna uh, repeat a story um, from the Obama White House, which predated me. Um, but there, the women senior advisors felt like they were not being heard, um, that they were voicing their opinions and it wasn't getting through. Um, and Valerie Jarrett called them all together and said, 
let's support each other. And every time we're in a room, when one of us says something, let's agree that someone else is going to just pause for a moment to say either, if you genu genuinely agree with it, I agree with it, or even if you don't, that's interesting. Let's listen to it. Um, and it's something I've so internalized. And actually, the more I put it into practice, and at first I did do it along gender lines, but then I realized that's artificial. Like the way we need to think about diversity is everybody's voice needs to be heard. So it shouldn't be, okay, I'm gonna do that for every woman in the room. It's, I'm gonna do that for everyone in the room. Now, some people don't need it as much because um, they're quite vocal um, and, you know, they have the ears of people, but to make sure during a meeting that everyone says something, so which means that if there, if someone hasn't by the end, say, do you have anything to share, or do you have, what do you think? Not in a way that puts them on a spot, on the spot, but gives a moment to say something. Um, and when people chime in, who don't usually chime in, taking a moment to lift it up. Um, and so this is a specific technique, but I say it because it's become how I think about all aspects of diversity and participation of whatever forum it is, how can I make sure that every voice is being heard? It doesn't mean that it's always gonna be agreed with, it's always gonna win the day, um, but whether it's written communications, spoken communications, um, how to just make sure that everyone is being listened to. Um, and, you know, I certainly notice when people do it for me, and I try and do it for others. I told you you were going to learn something practical <laughs> that you could take back to your offices. Listen, I, let me... Well, it's Valerie Jarrett, though. Yeah, give, yeah. give it to Valerie and, Jarrett. And Valerie very much, actually both Valerie and Laura very much wanted to be here tonight, but couldn't, um, in part to celebrate you because you practice what you preach, as they say. Um, listen, let me, I could talk to you all evening, but I want to make sure that we keep uh, our promise to keep on time here, and we still have a couple of more uh, things to do, including e eating dessert. I was just going to yes. say, that is important. Eating dessert is important. But, but let me ask you this, and, and really this picks up maybe on where we began with all the different roles that you've played in the profession and the wide perspective that you have, but also the times we live in. Um, as Sherilyn said, you know, we did this big conference on reimagining the role of business in the public square, and the reason we did it was because more and more of these questions are landing on the desk of business. Um, you know, the Edelman Trust Institute people worked with us on the conference, and they do these worldwide trust surveys, and one of the most surprising findings for people is that uh, if you look at institu all institutions, trust is declining in all institutions. But the institution that actually it's declined the least on, ironically, or maybe not ironically, is business. Uh, it's declined more in government, it's declined more in media, it's declined more in political parties, and it, it's declined the least in business, and yet, uh, and that's because people are uh, believe that business can get things done when it puts its mind to it. But then there's also incredible skepticism about business and about what business is doing and what people can believe. And you've now moved from the public sector back to the private sector and really in a, in a more significant role than you ever were in when you were in the, you were an associate before, now you're a, a senior partner in a leading law firm, advising clients uh, about how they ought to approach some of these issues that we've been talking about. And I wonder kind of how do you think about both building on the fact that business has the trust to do things, but also confronting the skepticism about whether business will do things, and what's the role of lawyers in doing that? Well, I'll put in a third aspect of that, 
which is that in a lot of um, the hot button issues of the day, business can no longer stay out of it. You know, it has been for several decades now um, the MO of the private sector to stay out of the social issues of the day and to stay out of politics. Um, that actually, if you go back to business ethics earlier in our country, that was not always the case. Um, but then it became sacrosanct that business should not touch politics and should not touch social issues. Um, and I think there was safety for business there, to be sure. That's no longer the case, because um, on everything that we now kind of shorthand as ESG, um, there's incredible pressure from some stakeholders uh, to take positions, and then there's backlash. Um, and some of Covington's clients uh, know that all too well. Um, and, you know, in some ways, I don't want to diminish how hard that is to be in that position as a company right now, um, but I also think it's maybe a good moment for our country um, because engaging the private sector in some of these issues is building up civil society, which can be a really exciting thing. And so I have really enjoyed playing a role in helping to advise companies in taking positions that are true to their values and true to their business, and that's a key part too, that manage the risk on both sides. Um, it can't just be kind of respond to the moment. It's gotta be decide what your values in your business is, take a position that feels right and be ready for lots of people to be unhappy with you, but feel good about playing a role in the country. Um, so I actually think it's an incredibly exciting and important moment for the private sector. Um, and I, I, being the optimist that I sometimes am and want to be, um, I will say that it's an opportunity to build trust further in, in business. And I'll just add one more dimension as somebody who teaches law students every day. Uh, if you want to get the best talent, if you want my students or the students of the other great law schools that everyone here went to, you're going to have to speak to these issues. And uh, Horacio Guterres, who was on the film, who's the general counsel of Disney, who I'd say probably knows more than anybody uh, <laughs> the challenges that Dana uh, spoke to. That's part of why he couldn't be here today. Um, when he, he said we did an interview with him for the practice, actually, when he was still at Spotify, and he said, you know, people think we're doing it because of the pressure of stockholders or the pressure of investors or the professor uh, or consumers. He said, no, we're doing what we do because of our employees. Because if we want to get the best and the brightest people to work for us, they have to believe that we have values. And uh, your clients are very, very lucky to have someone who can help them to think about values from all the different perspectives that you've been in. Dana, thank you so much. Thank for you. Being with us today. Thank you.